And this, of course, sounds the ultimate old boy set up two brothers in charge of the army and navy. But these two brothers were two of the greatest pioneers in their respective spheres in the 18th century British military. Far from being uh, the next in command, uh, Sir William Howe was chosen over 105 more senior generals. So just as Wolfe was chosen as a junior general during the French and Indian War, the British did the same during the American Revolution. They chose Sir William Howe because his great strength was in light infantry, which we might liken to modern day commando troops. He'd served in America. Indeed, he'd served at what would be regarded as the great British victory of the 18th century. He'd served alongside Wolfe on the plains of Abraham in the taking of Quebec. His brother, Lord Richard Howe, was appointed because Sir William insisted that if he was to uh, command the army, his brother must command the navy. This was very sensible because one of the greatest problems in any war is coordination between the services, but it was an even greater problem in this period because there was no uh, joint allied commander. There was no joint chief of staff. Uh, the navy was controlled separately from the army. The brothers could work together. But Lord Richard Howe illustrates one of the themes of this book, that there is a thin line between success and failure. Because Lord Richard Howe, although appointed because of his brother's wish, went on to become Britain's leading naval hero before Nelson. He won a battle called the Glorious First of June. He was a pioneer in amphibious warfare, that is using the army and the navy together. Uh, these two brothers landed 16,000 men and 40 cannon on Staten Island in early August 1776, within two and a half hours. Uh, Rick, Lord Richard Howe was responsible for introducing flat bottom ships into the British Army, who, uh, into the Navy, which were used by the Army, whose bows could go forward like gangplanks, and the troops could simply run off, much like <coughs> D-Day. John Burgoyne, until the Battle of Saratoga, was the, one of the rising stars in the British Army. He should have been more senior to Sir William Howe. He was the next in line to Sir William Howe, but for the fact that he'd spent some years as a debtor in France and had to resign his army commission uh, for several years. But Burgoyne was also an innovative military thinker. He was one of the first to really address the condition of troops in the British Army. After the uh, French and Indian War, uh, he'd served in Portugal, where he defended successfully Portugal against Spain. And this um, portrait, which is now in the Frick Collection, was commissioned by his commander as a reward for his successful uh, defense of Portugal. But Burgoyne went around Europe assessing all of the various armies, the Prussian army, the Austrian army, um, the French army, and he reported back to William Pitt, the elder, as to what lessons might be learned by the British army. But it was a very insightful report, because it argued, and this was an important sociological <coughs> point, it argued that you couldn't just transplant uh, the different methods of different armies. He said the British soldier would never uh, tolerate the conditions of Prussian troops. It's also worth keeping in mind that John Burgoyne was a junior commander. He was never commander in chief. This war was lost by two junior commanders, John Burgoyne and Lord Cornwallis, both of whom believed in taking risks uh, against their most cautious senior commanders. Sir William Howe never lost a battle he personally commanded against Washington, and those were some of the largest of the revolutionary...